is fate playing with us, destiny? Are we children of chance or cogs in a larger plan? Even quantum physics, crown of luck, could turn out to be a conspiracy. In the world of quantum physics, randomness reigns in the most obvious way. Oh, I am the delight of fate, says Romeo. Be still, great lover. We all are, or maybe not. Romeo, having killed Tybalt and realizing that he must flee Verona to escape death, expresses a view common in Shakespeare's time that we are all puppets and some higher authority pulls the strings. Luck, let alone our own decisions, plays little role in the unfolding of cosmic plans. Even processes that inherently, inherently involve, involve luck are considered predetermined. Long before dice were used in gambling, they were used as a means of divination. Ancient thinkers believed that the gods determined the outcome of each role. The apparent randomness arose from our ignorance of divine intentions. Surprisingly, modern science initially did little to change this view. Isaac Newton formulated laws of motion and gravity that connected everything in the world with a mechanism moved by a heavenly hand. The movement of the stars and planets followed the same strict rules as a cart pulled by a donkey. In this tuned universe, every, every phenomenon had a traceable cause. The intentions of the Almighty Although Newton's universe left little room for randomness, it at least provided tools to predict the Almighty's intentions. If you had all the relevant data surrounding the roll of the dice held in your fingers, trajectory, speed, surface, roughness, and so on, you could theoretically calculate each side of the die would end up on. And in practice, this work is extremely complex, but it does show that randomness is nothing intrinsic it's just a reflection of our lack of information. The belief in cosmic predictability, led by the French mathematician and physicist Pierre Simon de Laplace, proclaimed a century after Newton that, scientific, that sufficient information can predict anything that's going on and is going to happen in the universe, and going the other way, tell you everything that has happened as far back as the cosmic beginnings. This is brilliant, but also a rather disturbing idea. If everything is truly predictable, then surely everything is predetermined and free will is an illusion? Question mark? Romy, in other words, is right. Maybe so, says physicist Valerio Scarani, who studies randomness and its limits at the center of quantum technologies in Singapore. One might think that a single causal chain determines everything, say God or the Big Bang or Matrix robots, he says, then there is no randomness. The connection between a universe that admits randomness and a universe that admits free will is an old one, says Scarnani, Scarani, and in the 13th century, the great Christian philosopher Thomas Aquinas insisted that a perfect universe should contain randomness to allow humans their autonomy. But uh, he was also there to limit them. God created humans with less than divine abilities, so there must be a realm of events beyond our control. Now, Chaos and Free Will. Romeo and Juliet by Franco Zeffirelli with Leonard Whiting and Olivia Hussey were the tragic lover games of fate, were they? It was only about two centuries after Newton that some began to seriously question the concept of a predictable world. In 1859, the Scottish physicist James Clark Maxwell drew attention to the enormous differences in the results that can be produced by microscopic factors affecting the collisions of molecules. And this was the beginning of the chaos theory. It's, it is uh, most familiar, the butterfly effect. We're familiar with the butterfly effect a butterfly effect, that is the flapping of a butterfly's wings in Brazil, could spark a tornado in Texas. As chaos theorist Edward Lawrence put it in 1972, seems to restore unpredictability to the world. When a system is quite complex, the slightest approximation when working to the limits of your clock, barometer, or ruler, or the slightest rounding in a calculation can drastically affect the result. This is what makes predicting the weather so difficult. Its future state depends very much on the initial measurement, and we can never have a perfect initial measurement. 
So small human scale decisions can actually matter in the larger context. The plight of Romeo goes back to the initial circumstances that brought him uh, to uh, the same room as uh, where Juliet was, or even further back. If we take it too far, however, we may take them further back than even when our ancestors came down from the trees, which seems to defy any reasonable notion of human free will. It makes you scratch your head, that's true. But for now, we're only scratching the surface. That's because while we see, we seem to live in a reality where causes lead to predictable effects, and if we dig a little deeper, we see that things probably don't work that way at all. Quantum theory, which has been gradually developed since the 20th century, is our working theory of reality as it's mo at its most basic, and it rejects unshakable certainty altogether. Adrian Kent, mathematician at University of Cambridge, says, it seems to us through quantum experiments that nature is fundamentally random. The half-painted mirror. If you throw a single photon at a half-silver mirror, it can either pass through it or be reflected. Quantum rules give us no way to predict in advance what will happen. If you give an electron two slits in a wall to pass through, it will choose at random. If you wait for a single radioactive atom to emit a particle, you might wait a millisecond or a century. This rather indifferent attitude towards classical certainties may even be responsible for the fact that we are here. A quantum void that contains nothing can randomly and spontaneously produce something. Such careless energy fluctuation may best explain how our universe began. Explaining the explanation is more difficult. We don't know where the quantum rules came from. All we know is that the math behind them, which is rooted in uncertainty, lives up to a reality when we observe it up close. And these begin with Schrodinger's equation, which describes how the properties of a quantum particle evolve over time. The position of the, an electron, for example, is given by a width that spans space, and there is a set of mathematical rules you can apply to find the probability that any particular measurement will place the electron in any particular position. This is no guarantee that the electron will be in that position at all times, but if you repeatedly make the same measurement, repositioning the system each time, the distribution of results will match the predictions of Schrodinger's equation. The repeating, predictable patterns of the classical world are ultimately the result of many unpredictable processes. We go through the wall. The implications are interesting. Let's say you want to go through a wall. Quantum theory says this is possible. Each of the people who make you up has a position which could, by chance, turn out to be on the other side of the wall when it interacts. The probability of this happening is exceedingly small. And uh, the probability that all of your constituents will simultaneously be placed on the other side of the wall is uh, infinitesimally small. A solid quorum is the sum of all the probabilities. Welcome to reality. Einstein is particularly irritated by this probabilistic approach to real-world events, even making the famous remark that it is like saying that God plays dice. He assumes he assumed that there must be some information we're missing that could tell us the result of the measurements in advance. The hidden realities? In 1964, physicist John Bell developed a way to test for the existence of such hidden variables. His idea has since been implemented again and again using mostly entangled photon pairs. Entangled particles are a key feature of the quantum world. They have interacted with each other at some point in the past and now appear to share properties in such a way that a measurement on particle A instantly affects the result we get from a measurement on particle B and vice versa. So what's behind it? The detail of Bell's tests are complex, but the basic principle is like a sport in which two groups of experimenters play by different rules. The alpha team hypnotizes that the quantum correlations are due, hypothesizes the quantum correlations are due to some hidden exchange of information and makes their measurements based on the assumption. And the beta group, on the other hand, assumes that correlations are 
realized randomly by measurement. And Team Beta always wins. The strange correlation of the quantum world ri arises from fundamental randomness. Or maybe not. Physicists are still investigating the possibility that they exist. In the way we make quantum measurements, some holes which could distort the results and feign randomness. The fact that we cannot measure the state of photons with 100% accuracy, for example, or even the question of whether we have free will is choosing the measurements we make. Kent said, I think it's premature to say we've closed all of Bell's major loopholes. It's possible that one day the oddities of quantum theory will be explained, perhaps by reconciling some other beloved principle like Einstein's theory of relativity, or maybe someone will come up with a more inspired, non-random theory that will reproduce all the predictions of quantum theory while making some stronger ones. This hypothesis, hypothetical theory, should be a new theory, a successor to quantum theory, not a version of it, Kent says. Terry R Rudolph, a physicist at Imperial College London, agrees that quantum theory is our ultimate theory of nature and seems to indicate that the universe is random, but there is no guarantee of this. Skarin, he says, that I don't think we'll be, ever be able to prove it. He says, if so, perhaps randomness could be also be shown to be an illusion, and with it, perhaps our free will. Then quantum physics is just part of the big conspiracy. Fate's quirks? Maybe we don't have the freedom to decide that. The meteorologist, Ken Milne, head of numerical models of weather prediction science at the Met Office, how do you forecast the weather? He says, well, we create a model that represents the current state of the atmosphere based on many observations. The model predicts and calculates how the atmosphere might evolve. The forecast result is very sensitive to small errors in its initial phase. So we run a global model based on stochastic forecasting. And instead of running the model once, we make a series of small changes to the original model and rerun it many times to get a set of predictions. Some days the results are similar, which gives us a high percentage of certainty for the forecast. Other results can be radically different, so we have to be more careful, he said. How confident can you be in your predictions? The level of certainty varies from day to day, from forecast to forecast. In some cases, we may have large differences between the ensemble forecasts the greatest uncertainty often concerns major storms and other dramatic weather events of public interest, since the atmosphere must be in a delicate, unstable state to produce such events. The chaotic nature of the atmosphere system indeed imposes fundamental limits on forecasting ability. In terms of day-to-day -day weather forecasting, this limit is between 10 days and two weeks using probabilistic forecasts. Since 2011, the UK Met Office has started to provide forecasts of the chances of rain. Was it a controversial decision? We discussed it for a long time. Americans have been making such predictions for years, and they are now accepting in the, they accept it in the country. The argument in favor is that you often cannot, for many scientific reasons, say beyond a doubt whether it will rain or not. And this way, you give the population much better information if you tell them the possibility of rain. While we recognize that some people find probabilities difficult to understand, many people understand them and make better decisions because of them, he said. And this I've translated from a Greek article. Please leave your comments. Thank you for your support. I kindly support my Patreon account. The daily posts are five videos daily, and they are totally different from what I have on my YouTube channel. Thank you so much for your support and that you find all my content so interesting. You'll find the Patreon account details in the description box below.